you don't need the money yourself. You need the deals, right? So any, any smart real estate investor that has money is happy to do a deal with you if you have the product. So that's really what it's about. So young people can go out and really understand, focus on a certain, you know, certain area. So you know, you know, what a good deal looks like in that area. Be hyper focused on that. So you're an expert. You could be an expert in, you know, in one neighborhood and do really, really well, right? You don't need to be an expert in the entire country. Um, and honestly, I'll be honest, I, I focus so wide nowadays that I'm not focusing enough locally on how, how to invest my own money. Uh, and that's a problem for me. And, and, you know, when you're building big businesses, you know, there's only so many hours in a day, but uh, kudos to you because you're, you're doing it, man. You're investing and that's the smartest thing you could possibly do. You're listening to the Wake Up Wealthy Podcast, the only podcast that helps you turn pro in mind, body, spirit, and business. What is up, Wake Up Wealthy listeners? We have a very special guest on today, Mr. Jason Ciano, who I have dubbed the coolest man in commercial real estate. Jay, how are you? I'm terrific, man. I'm even better with that title now, so. <laughs> well, well, we, you know, so l let's talk about it quickly because you and I have talked about it. Um, I, I've played ball in the commercial real estate space. I remember, man, I remember when we opened up the NAI office, we went to this NAI event, right? And uh, do you know who Derek Lipsky is? I know the name, don't know him personally. So he's a big trainer. The NAI guys had him come in and train. And I mean, dude, he was spitting a ton of good content, very valuable stuff. And I could just feel my energy being sucked out of me in the room. Everybody was dead. And when I talk to you, when I talk to you, it's not that way. Yeah. Well, listen, man, you know, it, it, commercial real estate is a very traditional, non-innovative community for the most part. And, you know, I'd like to say that myself and my company, Sabre Real Estate, are the exact opposite. Um, you know, we're really good at what we do. And, and uh, we look at ourselves as, you know, kind of a bridge between the old school, traditional way of doing business uh, and we're as good as the guys who only focus on doing business that way but we're also cutting edge we use digital media heavy and uh you know we're smart about where the world's going yep. so i like to believe that we're kind of the perfect combination of old school traditional commercial real estate and kind of new school technology driven uh you know advisors essentially so that's right. kind of what we're Right. And we'll, uh, we'll dig into Saber a little bit. So for, for the listeners who don't know who you are, why don't you give us a little bit of background? Tell me your story, where you grew up, how you got into commercial real estate, if you did anything before that, kind of lay it out. Yeah, man. So, uh, so I went to college at the University of Arizona. Um, before that, grew up on Long Island in New York, outside of Manhattan, about uh, 35 minutes outside of Manhattan. Uh, normal, you know, awesome family, childhood, life, so on and so forth. Went to college. Uh, going into college, my family was in the automobile business, uh, always kind of assumed uh, that I would head in that direction and go into the car uh, business. Grew and up at, in a at what capacity? They, did they, own, they were uh, in dealerships? Yeah, so my family owned, uh, owned a car dealership and a motorcycle dealership across the street from each other. And uh, my father, my, my mother's side of the family was a long line of car dealers, basically. My father grew up without a dad in Brooklyn. Uh, poor and, uh, you know, enlisted himself in the Marines uh, as young as he possibly could to get in, get away and, and so on and so forth. So he came out of, uh, of the Marines and he married my mother and ended up uh, getting involved in the car business, but from, you know, a mechanic, like literally was given no uh, favors, you know, as a result of marrying into the family, just right. really built from the ground up. Uh, so for me, it was always assumed that I was going into the car business and, uh, you know, I've always been pretty good at, uh, at hustling, you know, I definitely from a young age on, I was slanging blow pops in like elementary school and, you know, always had kind of the hustler mentality, um, but never really thought about, uh, you know, what I wanted to do when I grew up, so to speak, it was just always assumed that I would go into the family business. And, uh, actually about, uh, three years into college, my mom was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, which obviously changed direction for the family quite a bit. And uh, for the first time, I had to start really uh, thinking about what I was going to do um, when I got out of school. 
And at that time, you know, my parents informed me that she was diagnosed and my father asked me uh, if I wanted to go into the family business and said, you know, you, you basically have to come now, home now because I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to focus and, and run this business. Um, you know, New York, New York is, is a, it's, it's, a, it's a grind to begin with, you know, the automobile dealership uh, world the, that is, is uh, super cutthroat. And, and in New York, you know, everything's just a little bit more cutthroat. Right. Uh, right. Well, let, let, let's, pa- let's pause there for a minute. Cause I, I want, I want to ask you about that. That's obviously very powerful story. So you're 20, you would have been what, 21 years old. I was, uh, I was right around uh, 22 years old about yeah. 22, 22. Okay. So you, you're in Arizona, right? You, you get this news and what was that? What was that like? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, as you can imagine, it just rocked my world. My mom was my North Star. So, you know, the thought of her not getting better and potentially not being around was very difficult for me to, to, to cope with. And, um, you know, however, I've always marched to the beat of my own drum. So, you know, I, I looked at this more as an opportunity to really start thinking about what I wanted to do. Um, because I knew that my dad, regardless of whether or not, you know, my mom was going to make it through and beat the cancer, that it was going to be very difficult on the family and that my dad would more than likely, uh, you know, not necessarily have his head in the game when it comes to, uh, to his business and whatnot, which is basically what happened. So, you know, I, I came back for a break. He sat me down, said, you know, do you want to, you want to get into the business? If you do, you got to basically leave now. I said, you know, dad, I respect your uh, opinion enough to decide what, what's best for you and, and the business. It's not my business. It's your business. And I'm definitely not leaving college. So do what you need to do. Interesting. Interesting. Now, um, there, there was one thing there that I wanted to touch on. You know, y- you instantly looked at that as it, it started your brain on, okay, what am I going to do as a career path? What am I going to do to make money? Right. And for a 22 year old, that's a very mature thought to have, right? Like whenever I was, you know, 21, 20, um, I, I was a very broken individual. Like I would have just hid from all of that. Right. And so were you, did you always have that level of like maturity? Where did that come from? You know, I, it's funny that you say that because, you know, I know, I know your history and, and admire where you've come. Um, and you have a great story and you're doing amazing things and helping people. Um, I, I, it, it was actually out of necessity and fear of uh, what what's going to happen because, you know, quite honestly, my mother always had my back and, you know, the thought of her not being around uh, meant that I knew I needed to grow up and, and uh, figure out shit for myself basically at that point. Right. So, um, and fortunately I was smart enough to do that because uh, after, you know, my mom ended up passing uh, uh, two years later, okay. uh, shortly after I graduated college, and, uh, you know, my father ended up, um, it, it, you know, he was madly and deeply in love with my mom that the ma- most amazing marriage, uh, but it kind of, it broke him as a person. And as a result, he, you know, sold anything and everything that, uh, reminded him of my, of my mother, uh, moved to Florida, you know, several short months after she passed and got remarried, uh, gotcha. to, uh, to somebody he didn't even know. Uh, and that obviously didn't, didn't work. It didn't uh, last, but, you know, so I, I basically was on my own at, you know, call it 24 years old, uh, had to figure out what I was going to do. Um, you know, had no, um, at that point, you know, my, my father had told me that, you know, I'm going to pay for your college. And when you're done with school, you're on your own, bro, figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you, you graduate college, you're in Arizona. Did you immediately go back to New York? I did. Yeah. My, you know, my mom was sick, so I knew the days were numbered. So I went back to New York. I, I uh, lived at home for about, uh, call it like two months over the summer. Okay. And my dad comes into my, into my bedroom and he's like, you know, what are you going to do? You got to go out, get a job, blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, I'm going to move to Manhattan. And, you know, I'm a, I, I was a DJ at the time too. And okay. uh, very, very involved in the nightclub world in, in, in New York city and, and Miami. Um, I was a club promoter also did that through college. Um, and then you also did, uh, Hampton share houses, uh, you know, things that you hear about if you're not obviously from New York, but, um, just basically chopping up like, you know, big homes in the Hamptons selling shares to, to young people, uh, you know, at, recently out of college essentially and making some money that way. And gotcha. uh, at the, yeah, at the time I was also, you know, super into partying. 
Right. Um, so at a minimum, I was uh, drinking free and getting paid to bring people to clubs and, you know, things of that nature. So again, just a, uh, just hustling, man. Yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. So you're in New York. You've been promoting, doing a couple side gigs, you know, hustling. What did you do next? Did you get into real estate or? No, it's funny, actually. So I, I, I had a friend whose sister had a high level position at Prada. Um, mm. So, you know, I ended up going there. It was my first job interview in, you know, after school, uh, after college, and I had no idea what to expect. Um, went in, met with the head of Prada for the U.S., and she liked my smile is what she told me, apparently. So <laughs> the opportunity to uh, be an assistant buyer for menswear, men's Prada, men's Miu Miu. Uh, I've always been, you know, into, into just style more primarily streetwear but you know fashion in general right uh you know so music fashion are things that always moved me so i took that opportunity because i just figured i'd be around interesting people and you know i'd be able to go out and do the nightclub thing at night and you know get up in the morning and and do that during the day until i figured out you know what i was going to be when i grew up so to speak so were you were you able to do that manage both Oh yeah, yeah. It wasn't it was, at that age. I could manage anything, right? But uh, it, it was, it was. I was burning the candle at both ends, um, getting very little sleep, and and you know, just in the in the nightclubs at night, and and showing, you know, sh- getting home with enough time to lay down for an hour, shower, and head off to my my day job. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so you're at Prada, right? Mm-hmm. What what happens, and how how long are you with Prada? Oh, about a year, probably a year and a half at most. Okay, so you're approaching 26 or 27? No, 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 no. I'm, uh, I'm, my mom passed, I was 24. No, it was about a year. So I was approaching 25 because I got into commercial real estate at 25. You got into commercial real estate at 25, okay. And uh, where'd you start? Why commercial real estate? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I my network's always been, uh, been, pretty solid and I know a lot of people and I've you know been fortunate enough to lean on that network that's how I got that job at Prada the same right. same way so um, you know it, real estate always interested interested me and you know set, uh, residential real estate was not something that was really of interest to me so I started to explore commercial did you even try residential I never did no you know it's I everything in my mind about residential was like driving around Mr. and Mrs. Smith and like working weekends and showing an open house and baking cookies I want none of that um not that I mean there's so many different sides to res- residential right so I'm just dumbing it down to yeah, my head I mean, I'll, I'll tell you right now so like you and I are similar in that area I started my career in residential real estate still have a team and uh I had to build a team because I could not deal with client relations right like there, there is something that just boils my blood about the emotion that is involved in it and like listen I understand that that's you know most individuals biggest investment of their life Right. But then when it comes down to like you're showing a house, like I remember I got into real estate, sold 46 homes my first year between April and November as a buyer's agent. So I was literally just showing all day long. And I remember just wanting, literally wanting to slip my wrist every time I got in the car because there's something about whenever you're showing a couple of house and, you know, whether it be a husband or a wife, they're like, you know, this house is perfect, but that wall's blue. Right. It's, it's an emotional, listen, it's very emotional. And that's ultimately what, what, that's why I gravitated to commercial because you're dealing with, you know, executives who are making decisions for different reasons. It's not their house. Right. So it removes a lot of the emotion. And uh, when I started out uh, just kind of deciding where I would go work, I interviewed and, and spoke to people at all the bigger firms. And then ultimately uh, a friend's, uh, a close friend of mine, his older brother was at a, uh, a boutique family firm that basically uh, was referred to as Breslin University, uh, where I grew up. They basically dominated, they pioneered uh, shopping center development um, and actually owned 9 million square feet of, uh, of shopping center space, primarily, you know, in New York Metro. And uh, I ended up uh, as a result of a few other things and the fact that, you know, I, I was pulled back to Long Island. I have a sister and uh, she was having a tough time in a relationship. And I decided that I would kind of come back and her and I would at least have each other. Uh, I took a job at that company and uh, at, I, I'll never, at, uh, at Breslin, correct. At Breslin. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I was, and it, it's interesting because it was outside of New York City, so that the the people at the company were substantially older than I was, um, and I saw that as an opportunity because every other company that I spoke to, you know, it, I was just going to be a number. I was going to be number thirty-eight on the, you know, who, yeah. who went to work there that year essentially. Um, so I saw that as an opportunity and I decided that I would basically cut my teeth there. Uh, when I spoke to the owner of the company for the first time, I slid my resume ac across the desk and told him I'd be the best broker that I'd ever meet, et cetera, et cetera. Meanwhile, he's, his family has spawned, uh, the best brokers in the industry in our area. Uh, it was a bold statement. I didn't even know what I was saying, to be honest, but why, why did you say that? Because I truly believed it, you know, I, I, the only thing I'll ever bet on is myself, right? So, you know, I'll make calculated risks on other things, but, it, you know, I, 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 I haven't just, failure's never been an option for me. Um, so when people ask me, like, why are you so driven, Jay? Like, you should be happy with where you are. Why do you, you know, work as hard as you do today, 18 years later in the business, essentially? Um, it's because, you know, I wake up every morning as, as, as if I haven't accomplished shit and, um, you know, I'm just super driven to put my own mark on the world. And at this stage of my life to help, help other people do the same. Um, I didn't have somebody who was very, uh, helpful, you know, to give me kind of the things to avoid, to kind of, you know, propel me up and help me, uh, become successful, like as a result of their input so i really just learned by trial and fire right. um i i was given a desk a phone and maps and things of that nature and i decided that you know any like any sales job you have to understand your inventory really well so i figured that's the only way that i could accomplish my goals so i set out and i drove every single shopping center in the area i took index cards and I drew the shopping center on the back of the index card. I came back to the computer and I learned who owned the shopping center, called every single person, introduced myself, uh, and spent about the first three, four months of, of, uh, of my, my newest days, obviously, in this new, new world, uh, just doing exactly that. So I covered the entire territory, drew every shopping center on an index card, wrote down all the basic information, ownership information, reached out and called all the owners, introduced myself personally interesting i dude i love i love i love the hustle i also love the tenacity of that statement right so were you because i'm like that dude like failure is just not a, it's never even been in the picture like aside from my eight months that i did as a buyer's agent too like working for someone else was never even in the picture. like just n that stuff is as incomprehensible for me as how far away the sun is right yeah. and yeah. but I got there through conditioning, right? So like, did you have experience, like what were some like major like hurdles that you had up until that point in your life? Obviously your mother was probably one. Yeah, that was, that was a pretty big one, man. Yeah, losing your mom is not an easy thing to deal with. Um, so, you know, that, but also kind of the removal of everything familiar for me at the time, right? Because it's not, I lost my mom, but at, as a result of losing my mom, I immediately lo lost my family unit as I knew it, right? So it wasn't really just losing my mom, it was kind of losing my family and you know, I had my sister obviously, but um, the, listen, my industry is very, you know, right? Commercial real estate's tough, man. It's as cutthroat as it gets. And again, in New York, it's, you I'm know, sure it's nuts. It, it's, it's absolutely nuts, man. People stab you in the front, forget the back. So, you know, <laughs> I, I, but I take Gary V's advice that doing the right thing is always the right thing. And I'm, uh, you know, and Andy Frisella, I'm super aggressively patient. Like, so to answer your question, I knew that one day I wanted to build my own company, but I didn't jump the gun and just do it, you know, uh, prematurely. I wanted to establish myself and by, you know, ultimately becoming the top producer at Breslin, which I did in the first, in about three and a half years, I became the top producer at the company. And then decided that, you know, it was time for me to spread my wings. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how I did that. I had an opportunity to pitch a little account called Starbucks Coffee. Um, and, you know, long story, but short story is I ended up getting the opportunity to work on the account. They wanted a senior level person to kind of spearhead the account and I would work on it with them. They noticed within about two months that this senior person was not doing anything and rather than fire us, they said, Jay, listen, man, it's your, you, this is an uh, amazing opportunity for you. Uh, so you can either rise to the occasion or, you know, you're going to miss one of the best opportunities in your career. How, I how did you get connected with Starbucks? How did that yeah. happen? 
That's like, and did you know at the time that that was like, did, what was Starbucks at that time? Starbucks was huge. I mean, you know, in, in a, they were like, I, I was drinking their coffee in college studying, right? So it was kind right. of already the go-to spot. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, this was early 2000s. So, you know, in New York, they had, they were very, uh, they're very present and dominating, you know, premium coffee. Um, so how did I get the opportunity? Somebody uh, that worked at the at the company had asked us to come in collectively to pitch the account that they weren't happy with their existing representation. I was very lucky that you know one of the people uh, knew that I was very hardworking and and um, that they wanted to bring me along on the pitch. Um, they ultimately ended up shitting the bed on the pitch, and I was forced to kind of step in and actually do the whole pitch myself. And this is a good lesson for for younger people in business. I didn't really, I, there was no way that I could tell them that I was going to be the best for the job because I wasn't. I didn't understand how to roll out a, a national coffee chain, um, no less, you know, develop a strategy, an expansion strategy and roll and, and execute it. Um, but what I did know is that I worked for one of the best firms in the area and I basically spoke about the firm and what we collectively as a company could do. Uh, and I think they they appreciated that honesty. And I learned very quickly on the Starbucks account that if you don't know the answer to something, never make it up. Because I'm always surrounded by people that are a lot smarter than me. And mo more often than not, those people are asking you calculated questions for a reason because they're testing your character and they want to understand if you're just going to make shit up or if you're going to say, you know what, I'm not really sure about that. I'm going to look into it and get back to you. And that's the number one thing. And I do it now where when I have younger people that, uh, you know, I'm just trying to figure out who they are, I'll ask them questions I know the answer to, and uh, you get to know them really well. Um, yeah. <laughs> go Man, ahead. I, loaded, I loaded, qu loaded questions, they're always there. And see, I've like, I guess I never felt the need to really make shit up. Like early on in my career, whenever people would ask me questions, like I, I've always, dude, I've never, almost never had a filter to a fault, right? But I was, I would always just be like, you know, I'm not sure, but my value add always was I'll work harder than anyone you know combined. Not the same way. Yeah, I think that's why we get along. I'm the, I'm the same exact way, but I think, you know, people end up fudging stuff because they want to be the smartest person in the room. You're never going to be smarter than somebody who's been in the business 30 years and, you know, has done it forward, backwards and sideways, but and and I take I teach my people because you know, in, we're in the information business, we're in the relationship business. My people will have information that is very useful and they'll feel the need to share it with people just to be proud that they actually know what they're talking about. But guess what? The smart person on the receiving end of that is using that information to their advantage and you just screwed yourself out of a deal. Right. So. Ego, ego just got lost you a deal. Completely. And it happens all the time. You know, people like to, it's an insecurity, right? If you're sitting, if you're sitting across from somebody and uh, there's information that you know, and they're, it, you just naturally want to share it to sound smart and in the know. But if you share the wrong information, it's going to hurt you in the wallet in a, in a major way. Um, so after I, I started on the Starbucks account, I was out visiting friends in LA and uh, I was working out of a FedEx office it was a FedEx Kinko's at the time. It was years ago, obviously. Um, and I saw this awesome new thing that uh, drew my attention. And I walked right out of the FedEx across the street. And I walked into this place that changed my life. And uh, this little place was called Chipotle. So I ended up uh, going in, seeing what they were about, and just uh, calling corporate, you know, in just nonstop talking about when they were going to come to New York. And uh, long story short, I ended up bringing them to New York. So, uh, so I had some good accounts, learned how to develop a, a, a strategy for Starbucks, a strategy for Chipotle, executed those strategies. And then the big firms, you know, started to notice uh, Cushman, Newmark, JLL, um, CBRE, they all came knocking. And uh, I didn't want to leave Breslin, but I also knew I needed to grow because you also, you know, at, at, 20, 28, nine years old, however old I was at the time, uh, you don't want to be the top producer anywhere. You know, you kind of, right. at that young of an age, right? You got to, you, if you want to get better at something, you have to go work for people that are better than you. Uh, so I went to CBRE and, and wanted to learn the more corporate side of uh, the industry and obviously focus on 
more than primarily the retail restaurant stuff that I was already doing. Uh, so I learned, you know, the, the office worlds, the industrial worlds, uh, multifamily worlds. And I knew that that knowledge would help me eventually launch my own company. So that's kind of how the, the two tiered approach, I ended up uh, marrying both my uh, history and knowledge from Breslin and my history and knowledge and relationships from CBRE and, uh, you know, took the best practices and started Sabre uh, about four years after uh, I started at CBRE. And uh, that was now eight years ago. So that was it. That was eight years ago. So how old are you now, Jay? Are you, are you uh, 42. 42? Okay. Um, so dude, every time I hear you tell the Chipotle story, it gives me the chills. Cause that's just like, Every young, like commercial real estate guy's wet dream. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it, it is, but it's, you know, for it, it's, it's a very specific niche that we focus on, right? So, you know, the, we have the, the tools and technology, and more importantly, the people, the staff of people that can actually use all this technology and, you know, sort this data. Uh, demographics, psychographics, mapping software, now AI, you know, location technology, um, GIS stuff like that's, that's insane. And, you know, so, so you have to be really uh, an expert in that industry, in that specific niche within commercial real estate to do it in a major way. Uh, you know, fortunately, uh, we, we do that for about 50 national retailers in all different, you know, shapes and forms. Uh, all different size ranges, all, all different geographies. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's a big part of our business. Yeah. You know, it, it's, I, I mean, in the simplest way to put it, like you were a tenant rep guy, right? But right. there's a difference between a tenant rep guy and someone who is rolling out expansion strategies in new markets for national chains. Like it's an understatement. It is. And I got another good story. I don't know if you heard this one, but um, so when I got to CBRE, January of 2007, I ended up walking from the Starbucks and Chipotle accounts. I left them with my old company and I didn't want to burn a bridge. And uh, I had to basically start from scratch. Fortunately, CBRE gave me a good enough package that afforded me the opportunity to start from scratch. Uh, it was also the first time I ever had health insurance. I'm sure you can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I ended up, uh, somehow I came across Massage Envy. And uh, I ended up picking up the phone and called corporate. They gave me uh, the area developer's phone number. I called him and got him on his cell. He's like, Jay, very nice to meet you. You have great timing and horrible timing. I'm like, why is that? He's like, I'm coming into your market on Monday and I'm touring with your competitor. I said, oh, that's interesting. When do you get into town? He's like, Sunday, I land at 11 a.m. I said, great, what airport? I'll pick you up. So that's another lesson. So I prepared for a massage envy site tour on the fly and uh, picked this gentleman up at the airport and toured him on Sunday. And he told the broker that he was supposed to be touring with on Monday that he already hired a broker, which was me. And uh, from there, this is a crazy story, but had, had great success developing several states uh, for these guys at Massage Envy. Um, got to become very friendly with these guys. I get a phone call from them. Uh, this is probably a year and a half after meeting them. Jay, you got to fly down to South Florida. We got this new concept. I want you to check it out. I do. It's called European Wax Center. So they ended up partnering with two brothers who started European Wax Center and uh, were planning to roll out the franchise across the country. And they did that. I helped them a lot with the uh, strategy for you know selling territories, area development rights, things of that nature um, on the real estate front. And uh, fast forward a little bit further, I'm in a car driving with one of these gentlemen and his wife in New York City looking for massage envy sites. And his wife keeps talking about this other concept in South Florida called Ellen's Ultimate Workout. And he's laughing at her about the concept and the name and everything else. Uh, fast forward, I get a call from him, you know, call it a, a year later. We have this new thing under development. You have to come check it out in South Florida. I do. And I work out at the first Orange Theory Fitness. Wow. Wow. See, I got the chills again, dude. That's yeah. nice. Cause, I mean, I've got, we've got, I live in Springfield, Missouri, right? Like 250,000 people. We just got an Orange Theory Fitness last year. People are pumped. Like you, yeah. I'm on the phone with the guy who did the first one. Just amazing. Right? Yeah. So, so it, you know, I mean, that's really, 
So that I, I've been for, and that's what, that's what I love so much about what I do. Like I get into emerging concepts super early that I, I become an advisor to the founders of the concept because the orange theory that you see today is not the orange theory that I worked out in, you know, right. uh, seven, eight years ago. Um, the, it was, it was similar in nature, but you know, it, when you start a concept, you need to get iron out the kinks and understand what a prototype is going to look like before you scale it. Uh, these guys are, are obviously some of the, the, uh, the best franchisors uh, in the world today. And uh, they have over a thousand units in, um, in, like I said, about seven, eight years. And they've covered every single market, which is why you know what Orange Theory Fitness is. So right, it's, it's, right. I mean, sh shit doesn't come here unless it's big, right? Unless it is, every, unless it is everywhere else first. Uh, yeah, you know what? The person who bought the the rights to Messiah, uh, to Orange Theory Fitness in your neighborhood is uh, is very fortunate they did. They're gonna, they're gonna crush it, man. It's it's one of the best franchise concepts I've ever seen. So, you okay? So first you did the restaurant deal, right? You know, Chipotle, Starbucks, that area. Then you move into this more health related field, right? Fitness, massage, massage envy, which leads me to the question, tell me about solid core. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, let, let me let me back up for a second. So, okay. you know, I, uh, restaurant hospitality, service oriented stuff, right? Fitness, wellness, these are all uh, things that I've always focused on myself as a broker, as, as Jay Ciano, the real estate broker. Yep. But when I built my company, you know, we do everything that a very strong retail focused New York Metro company does. And we have several different divisions, tenant rep in New York Metro, development rep, landlord rep, project leasing in New York Metro, investment sales that, that gets into the other service lines, the industrial, the office, the multifamily stuff, right. and then national, national advisory which is the good transition into solid core. So yeah, yeah okay. Um, so I, I I did jump too far. I've got questions here. Okay, yeah, so yeah. you okay? So you're doing Orange Theory Fitness. You're doing Massage Envy. You're at CBRE at that time, right? That's tell correct. me, tell me about the transition from the boutique family brokerage to the whole, you know, big office commercial mindset. Like, were there any, um, you know, tough th things that were tough for you to transition? You went from being the biggest fish in a small pond. You know, like, how did that play out? Yeah, totally. So, you know, companies like CBRE are very corporate in nature. They're really office and industrial driven. Retail is not their primary focus in most markets. Um, so, you know, I got there quickly and realized that even though I was a top producing retail broker in New York, um, I was still, you know, I, I wasn't very... Um, I was low on the totem pole, which was great. I needed that, right? I needed to come back into yeah. reality and realize, you know, how, how young I was. I had some success, but I still, you know, had, had a lot to learn. Um, so, you know, it was realizing by doing the things that, that the boutique family office was really good at and expecting the same service to me as a broker, as an agent or an advisor, you know, if I requested a sign to be put up on a property, at CBRE, I got like a five page document that I had to fill out that basically I needed a law degree to get a sign up on a property. And that was a problem for me. I'm like, you know what? There is so much red tape in my business. If somebody, a property owner tells me, you, Jay, go ahead, put a sign up. That sign needs to be up tomorrow. Right. I can't start negotiating a document. Hey, I'll send you our document and hopefully we'll have the sign up in three months. So, you know, that was the biggest issue that I had. And, and my mentor and my my you know, former boss at Breslin had always said, you know, these big companies cannot do retail really well outside of Manhattan and, and Manhattan I wasn't really servicing at the time. So, you know, I, I started to learn really quickly what they meant by that, what he meant by that. And it was very true. So, you know, there was a lot of red tape. Uh, they expected me to show up every day with a suit and a tie, which was normal for me, by the way. I, I, I always had a, um, everybody at Starbucks kind of used to make fun of me because I, they asked me to come move boxes in their office once on a Friday, uh, like after work, and I showed up in a, in a suit and tie. Uh, but again, that's like insecurity, right? That's, you're, I was trying to establish credibility because I was so young, yep. and I had a pretty meaningful opportunity ahead of me. So I always wanted to, you know, to, to show up well and, and put that 
a little bit of a facade on with the monkey suit and whatnot, which you have to do a little bit when you're younger if you want to be taken seriously in corporate uh, environments, obviously. So yeah. I, I learned all that stuff really quickly. And when I got to to CB, I knew that it just wasn't entrepreneur. It wasn't going to scratch that entrepreneurial itch that I always had. Um, so I just looked at it as a stepping stone for me. So let's let's talk about that. How wait? How long were you at CBRE? So I had a five year contract that I signed. Um, I ended up uh, terminating that contract four years in and paying them back the unamortized portion of the upfront cash bonus they gave me. Okay. Okay. So um, you had this entrepreneurial itch. You mentioned something earlier that really stood out to me, which was being aggressively patient. Um, that is something that I have, I have only acquired patience in the last 18 months, I would say. Right. And it, it is like one of the biggest issues that I notice with my generation guys remotely around my age and expect, like I have, my parents had me at 17. So I have, I have brothers who are 15 and nine and uh, I notice it even more in them. Right. Like, sure. And you work with young guys now. How often do you see this? Oh, my God. You know, listen, commercial real estate, again, as you know, you have to be patient. I mean, because if I if I sign a lease today with a company, I'm not getting paid for, let's call it eight to 12 months. OK, so it's a very difficult business. And the only way that you could do it and you end up going on draw, which means you're borrowing money. So, you know, when I, I, I was I had a draw in my first job at Breslin, I, I had six figure debt that I owed the company. Fortunately, my pipeline on paper, you know, I was worth millions, honestly. So with all my Starbucks, Chipotle and every other deal that I had, uh, it wasn't an issue. But, you know, I, it, it, the reality was that I owed the company, uh, you know, I think about $150,000 before I left. Um, and it actually helped me because when I was able to get money from CB, go there, all of the money started to come in from Breslin. So I ended up, you know, uh, really realizing that that money later on. So the harsh reality in our business is I can stop working today and I'll be good for the next 12, 18 months. But in 12 to 18 months, I'm screwed. Right. And then um, you're screwed for another 12 to 18 months if you haven't done the deal. Yeah. You can't take your foot off the gas, man. Yeah. So. Um, so the toughest part for young people, you know, and it's funny because I, I act like a millennial, like I get it. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 42 years old, but I am, I am uh, 25 at heart um, and I still operate like I'm 25. Um, so, you know, the toughest part I think is to get younger people to truly understand that you need to become an expert at something, uh, you know, before going all into something. And, you know, that, that, that takes patience. And, you know, I'm not a, a very patient person either by nature, but I'm smart enough to realize that if I want to be the best at something, I'm not going to do it in five years. You know, I'm not going to do it in 10 years. Fortunately for me now, Brody, I'm approaching 20 years, you know, so right. I would like to consider myself an expert. Um, and, you know, my, my, it's not for everybody though. Like the reality is I have young people all the time come into my office and say, you know, Jay, I appreciate the opportunity, everything you've done for me, but I'm going to go travel the world and, you know, go, uh, or I'm going to go, I decided that I want to, you know, just, uh, just caddy for six months, you know, in some random place and, and so on and so forth. And that's great. And depending on your age, I'm all about that. Right. But I knew that I needed, needed to start my career at 25 in a field that I was going to be interested in pursuing basically for the rest of my life. Um, I set a goal for myself to make my first million dollars by the time I was 30. Uh, and by making that jump and, and going to CBRE, I was able to fulfill that goal. Um, I spent all that money in the stupidest ways possible. So it's, it, it's as if I never had it. Uh, you know, I also paid off like debt and you know, I was living high uh, on the hog. I had a, an Escalade and an S55 AMG Mercedes both? I did it all, both at, at the same, same time. time. Yeah, yeah, of course. Totally, totally unnecessary, man. Totally, see, totally necessary when you think that that's all that matters at that age. Well, yeah, yeah. Like, dude, I'm so glad that I see, just, you know, in the way that I have had my 18 to 25, so I'm 25 now, you know, and I started, I started in business at 22, and dude, I did, I, I'm past that now. Like, I, I bought, I bought a Rolex with all the money in my bank account. And, and you know what? I hope a lot of people watching this are not going to do that as a result of watching this or listening to it, because it's very tempting to do when you, when you 
get a little success and you make a little money, the first thing you want to do is go buy dumb shit. Right. That's anybody. I mean, because we grow up on MTV culture, right? It's like, and now with social media, it's all you see. Yeah, man. I mean, I had, I had, oh, I bought a black Rolex Mariner, and I had always wanted that watch. I actually bought my dad a Rolex before I bought mine, but yeah. uh, then I spent, I, cause he had always wanted one and didn't make a ton of money. You know, he's always had the, he's had me since he was 17 and I was, you know, an expensive kid. Right. And um but dude like just thinking back at it now it's like i i, I wear my apple watch you know what i mean like it, it is just it's so funny to me my relationship that i had even just two years ago with money and with that watch like it, it was just perspective comes in yeah i mean listen I, I i'm i have several watches and the reality is that a rolex actually holds its value so exactly. you know and, and, and beyond holds its value. It increases in value depending on the watch. So yep. there are way dumber things to buy, like a car, right? The minute that you, and, and I know this, right? My family was in the car business. The minute you drive a car off of the dealership lot, it goes down like this. There is nothing good about spending a lot of money on vehicles. And, you know, depending on what business you're in and if you're able to, you know, put a lease through a company and, you know, the things of that nature, which it makes complete sense. I'm touring clients all day, you know, and, and I need to have a comfortable uh, vehicle to do that and, and fit a lot of people in it and things of that nature. So I could justify that expense very easily. Yeah. But if I'm just trying to high side to the club, you know, it's probably not the smartest decision. Yeah. And don't get me wrong too. Like I like, I like, I like watches, car, yeah. cars, not as hyped on, uh, but I like watches. Like right now I really want an AP, but it's just not that net. Like I'll fucking, I'll get it at some point when Listen, I, you, you will, and you'll deserve it and it'll feel that much better. I'm wearing a, where is this thing? I'm wearing a gold Rolex right now. So, and I want to, call that out because obviously if I don't do that, I'm going to look like a chump talking about how you know, <laughs> watches are meaningful. Um, and, and listen, the reality is that, uh, that a lot of times, you know, I won't wear this watch uh, in, intentionally, right? You know, and I think uh, a lot of people would want to have this type of a watch to wear everywhere to, to, to floss and show people that they're, you know, that to they're floss. successful. Right. I mean, that's the reality. I, I wear it less frequently and I, and I have considered selling it. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm also not going to do that because it's not like I just need the money. Uh, and it's and, and it's OK to buy nice things and enjoy nice things when you've worked your ass off for a very long time to get them. I think, you know, I think it's important, too. you got to do things for yourself. Totally, dude. And and, and I agree. So, OK, you know, th that poses the question to me. Well, we actually, we still have we had we still have some story to get through. Okay, so you're at CB you're at CBRE. You've had this entrepreneurial itch. W when and why did you start Saber? So I saw the economy. Obviously, the lows of of 2008. I'm at CBRE, and fortunately, I always called CBRE a port in a storm for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how to not work hard every day, so I was still, uh, you know, I was still a, a, a big producer at the company in a short amount of time worked my butt off. And uh, as the market started to, the economy started to turn a little bit for the positive, uh, I decided that, you know, I needed to start exploring my options. The reality was that there were no options for me. So I decided that if I felt that way, there had to be other people in the industry that felt that way. And uh, I felt responsible for creating a new option for people um, in, in retail real estate primarily. So I ended up calling up my old boss and mentor, uh, Ken Breslin, and uh, asking him to go to lunch. We went to lunch. I told him I wanted to start my own company. Uh, I asked him if he was interested in doing something with me, me leaving CBRE, him dissolving his company, coming together. And he laughed and chuckled and said, you know, Jay, it sounds good, but I, I, I don't really need to do that. I'm not that interested. Uh, I'm good with where I'm at. I said, I appreciate that. I just wanted to let you know that the reality is, at no disrespect, I personally represent more tenants than your whole company does today. So if I start something, it's going to be meaningful. I'm very confident about that. And you know, now if I'm at CBRE, it's not JC Anno's company. So I don't have, let's say, the same hunger you know, to make sure that I'm going to dominate the world, essentially, uh, because you know, the minute that you, you open up a business, 
it, it, you're sticking your neck out in so many different ways and failure, like I said, is not an option. So I'm going to become probably a bigger competitor. And I just wanted to, you know, and that's not a threat, obviously. I'm just saying right. that's reality. That's what, what's going to happen. So I get a call from him the next day. Can you come in? Let's chat. We, uh, we actually ended up kind of just writing the, the basics of a, a business partnership on a napkin. And I left CB. He dissolved his company. We started Sabre, which stands for Ciano and Breslin Real Estate. Love it, dude. Love it. So he dissolved to a family brokerage that had been around and was Correct. ruling the Long Island area. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. You know, I wasn't going to leave a good thing or partner with him, um, you know, if we weren't in it together, essentially, you know, completely. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he totally understood that. Um, he He asked me if I would basically come on as a partner and uh, and, and, you know, shape the direction and the future of his business at Breslin, and, at Breslin correct. And that wasn't good enough for me. Uh, I felt like I was going back um, and that would be perceived as backwards in my community as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll be honest with you, it would probably from a cash position and a compensation position would have been smarter and better for me at that time because the tax consequences of borrowing millions of dollars uh, and, and using that to build a business are terrible. Um, and unfortunately, our government is not very business friendly when it comes to that. So right. um, it, it's, it's uh, you know, so I would have had a different structure and probably uh, had more income quicker than I did uh, starting from the ground up. Uh, I also would have had a, you know, a pipeline of his business that was coming in and yeah. had a, you know, had some, some of that. But uh, so know, you, I, I you take the path. Less travel, typically, my friend. Right. So you started Saber. It's what 2010. Uh, yeah, the end of 10. The end of 10. Okay. So where was social media at at this time? And the reason that I ask is because Saber, in my opinion, you guys do something that commercial real estate firms don't do. Right. You use social media. You have a vlog. You have a personal brand. People know who you are and what you're about. And this is not something that is characteristic of a commercial real estate broker, right? When did, where was social media at in 2010? Because I was in high school, I, like I, I didn't have a fucking clue what that did for business, right? I never thought that way. And uh, like, wait, how'd you pinpoint that? Yeah, so social media didn't exist to me back then. Um, you know, the internet wasn't even really, uh, you know, having much of an impact on my life back then. Um, so, you know, I started to get heavy into social media about, um, call it two years ago. Uh, it was this time in 2016 that I, I had a couple of um, interesting things transpire at Sabre. I was going through some growing pains, and uh, I, I can't um, I can't ever stop thinking. So I was thinking of ways that I could differentiate myself from the rest of the commercial real estate cr community and, and create more awareness uh, for Sabre specifically. And I decided that a vlog would do that. So. Um, I ended up just picking a few people's brains that knew more about that stuff than I did and went out, got a, 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 a DSLR and, and uh, just set out that January 1, basically, to, to create the first episode of Real Saber and uh, did that. And actually today, in a, in a few moments, uh, episode 99 will drop. I knew and that 100 was close. Yeah, so next week is 100, and I'm retiring Real Saber and going a different direction with a new vlog. Uh, so I'm excited about that. But, you know, it's funny because you, again, it's nice talking to you because you understand commercial real estate. So, right. you know, I was putting myself out there for people to make fun of because... That's you know, what I was going to ask. What kind of feedback were you getting? Most people didn't get it and uh, and totally, you know, made, made poked fun at it. I mean, you know, the nice part is that, again, I've always done the right thing. I started in this business, in this industry from the bottom up. So you can love me, dislike me, whatever. Uh, you res you're going to respect me, right? Because uh, the accomplishments that I've made across, over time, uh, nothing was handed to me and it's not easy to do. So anybody in the industry respects me and they also know that I, um, you know, I'm creative and I'm not, I'm not uh, going to kind of just conform, right? So, yeah. so people expected that of me, but they didn't realize the genius behind it uh, two years ago, right? So uh, today, you know, it's a completely different uh, 
very different when I see people. It's actually really the only thing they want to talk about is the videos. Really? Um, has, any, has anyone followed? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's very, very, you know, it's a very, uh, I would say, narrow audience for Real Saber of people in the in the commercial real no, estate. No, 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 no. I mean, has anyone else in commercial real estate done that? Uh, you know what? Uh, I, one individual started a vlog that lasted maybe three weeks. And right. gave up. So, the, yeah, not really. Um, so, you know, we're, we're definitely still... Uh, still, you know, on the cutting edge side of that. And as over the last two years, um, I started to develop an in-house digital media team uh, solely geared to you know, all of the marketing stuff that we do uh, that, you know, is either video stuff and, and social media things. So we have built an in-house team, which I think is very unique for a commercial real estate company. Totally. And if I'm not mistaken, you do some work for other individuals, right? Yeah. So I have another business called Be Creative, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically a digital marketing uh, consulting business. Uh, and it, it's interesting because a lot of times, as you'd imagine, uh, you know, clients, friends, all different types of people see me now as uh, somebody who's, you know, doing some interesting stuff with social media and video. Uh, so they would always ask me, you know, who does that for you? And, and uh, I was always really the one kind of uh, doing it. So I assembled a team of, uh, of people that I was working with that are very, uh, you know, good at what they do and, and responsible and professional, which is not easy to find in the creative right. space, as you so, know. So what kind, uh, of, what kind of services do you guys do though? What, what does consulting mean in this context? Yeah, sure. So, you know, a lot of my friends and clients own businesses, right? So they come to me and they say, Jay, I want to develop my personal brand. Jay, I want to uh, brand refresh and, and build a new website. Right. Uh, Jay, I need some help with, with social media. I'm not on LinkedIn. I need to build a page. I have an Instagram, but it's, you know, it's not gaining a lot of traction. Can you give us guidance and advice on that? Um, so, you know, all of the above, uh, essentially. Um, but, you know, it's nice, too, because having built Sabre, I'm very good at project management, and making, right. making sure that our clients are, you know, serviced really well. Um, so, but we're also very thoughtful about, you know, who we take on as clients. I have to, from a creative perspective, I have to be aligned with the, you know, the, the, um, the vision of the company and, and the culture of the company. Uh, I've always been very creative. I'm, I'm art, artistic and, you know, this has enabled me to be more creative than you can typically be in commercial real estate. As you see, I've tried to be pretty creative in commercial real estate, but right. it's only so creative that you could be in the field. I, I would say you're pushing the limits. I think so. At a certain point, it just, it's pointless. Right, right. Um, okay, so yeah, you've, you've built Saber, you've got this Be Creative business. Um, what, what came next, right? When did Solid Core come in? That's the most interesting thing that I look for on your stories because yeah. there's nothing like that here. There's nothing like that? No. Yeah, so we should probably come there. So, uh, so Solid Core is uh, a client that I met about two years ago. And uh, Ann Malum is a, a, a really interesting person. Sorry, that's my email. Uh, right. So really, really uh, interesting person. She, before um, starting Solid Core, she started a charity called Back on My Feet, which is a running club for homeless people. Okay. Um, real, real interesting story. And I, I welcome people to go check out Back on My Feet to learn a little bit more about that. Uh, but Ann started Solid Core with uh, all the money she had in the bank, which was not much, in DC in her backyard uh, about five years ago now. And before I met her, she had grown to about five or six locations in, uh, in DC Metro. Uh, Insta Live turned off, I was just notified. <laughs> it's been an hour. Yeah, uh, all good. So she, uh, yeah, so she developed it in DC, had five or six studios. And we had met and through a, actually a friend in the industry who was service, servicing her locally in, in DC, she wanted to expand outside of DC. He made the introduction because that's what I do. And uh, the rest is history. We just opened the 30, 41st location um, in, I believe the 41st was in, I don't know, either Madison, Wisconsin, Connecticut or Chicago. Okay, so, uh, so SolidCore is just, a, that's another client of yours. That's another client of mine that I'm heavily, heavy, heavy, heavy involved in. That makes sense. I was gonna say, sure, shit. Spend a lot of time, a lot of time there. Um, I thought, I thought that it was part of your deal. 
Yeah, no, it's not me, um, but it's, uh, it's a close friend that I advise very closely on, uh, on all things business related. Um, and yeah, I built the website, you know, very involved yes. in the brand. Nice. So they're a good case study for kind of what I do as a whole on both the Saber side and the yep. Be Creative side. Okay. So we are, uh, dude, we're almost caught up here on a, on a timeline. So what's, what's going on now? What's going on now? I guess I'd like to talk about the new vlog, which is called Future Proof. So I'm going to focus a lot on how to help business owners and, and you know, sales uh, oriented professionals in real estate and, and, and all lines of business understand how important it is to develop a personal brand because you are an extension of your business. And in today's world, if you're not using social media and video uh, to talk about, you know, how you differentiate yourself and why people should get to know you, you're invisible in my opinion. Um, and I think people are still very reluctant to do that. But I also believe that over the last two years, I've proven how important it is um, because you and I would never have met if I didn't do that. And that goes for a lot of other people, right? So that right. I meet all the time. So I think that's really important. So yeah, I'm excited about Future Proof. And I, you know, I want my name to become synonymous with the term Future Proof. Right. And uh, I'm going to dig into that a little bit and, and ultimately write a book uh, as well. Excellent. Excellent. Um, dude, I love that. And I love that you're going a, uh, a new direction or that dude, the importance of a personal brand. I mean, when, so did you start, you started the vlog in 2016. Did you really start building you during that time as well? Not really. No. I mean, you know, I, I don't have much time as you can imagine. So, you know, there's only yeah, so okay. many projects I could take on at a time. Um, you know, so I, I, my personal brand has been more through, you know, my use of Instagram and, uh, and the vlog. Um, but uh, I'm in the process of, of building a website, you know, for myself. Yeah. Um, I, I, I kept, I, I've had several false starts where I just haven't had the time and energy to finish it. And, uh, and we develop websites. So that's pretty scary. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but well, I had a meeting with my team. You've done, you've done a really good job if you have, I, I mean, you're an individual who has got 15 years on all of the guys, like uh, you were at an event of all young guys who, you know, want to quote unquote, build personal brands. Yeah. Um, I mean, so you're in the network, dude, you've done that, right? I appreciate that. And, you know, and you and I really, uh, we met briefly at an event and then were reintroduced kind of through Tyler Harris. Yes. Um, you know, he, he kind of mentioned, uh, mentioned each other to, to us and and I was like man I I never reached out you know and I felt stupid uh, and I'm super happy that he did that Tyler's a beast you know I love what he's doing I I do as well I'm gonna I'm gonna have Tyler on I had it looks like I really enjoyed being on his podcast like I, I don't love getting on podcasts just because everybody wants to talk about my past right and and I get it like and I love having that out there because it, it people need to hear it right and yeah. that's a big part of my message but there's something about I can't deliver it that's my story has become so monotonous from a podcast standpoint that it's tough for me to deliver the emotion that needs to come with that story every single time. So I don't get on podcasts often anymore, but Tyler's I had fun on man. Yeah. Yeah. He's great. He's doing big things. Um, I, I enjoyed being on both of his podcasts, but shout out to Tyler. Shout out to Tyler. That's at Tyler Harris page. He's going to love that one. Um, okay. So, you know, you're going to focus on the new blog, Saber, growing as always. Saber, uh, yeah, but meaningful. You know, I, I'm, I've actually, uh, I, I'm, I'm really approaching 2019 with the term uh, lean and mean in 19. Okay. Uh, I know there's going to be a market correction in the next 18 to 24 months. Yes. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm, relatively good at timing uh, the market and you know I have a tremendous overhead at Sabre and I need to always be thoughtful about the money that we're spending and what we're investing in mm -hmm. so at the end of the year I also you know do a deep dive into the business and see what's working what's not working um, and I have a, a really good grasp on what that is right now and uh, so I'm gonna you know definitely uh, refocus on certain things um, and really become, again, like focus more on being an advisor uh, than just solely a real estate broker uh, to my clients. Uh, that's the most important thing for me. Let's talk, let's talk about the market correction. Uh, you know, you're here, I'm starting to hear 
rumbles of it, right? Like it, it's coming, it's about time, we're peaking. Like what can the what can the young entrepreneur, right? The guy who's a hustler right now is doing well because people have money, market's good, you know, maybe he's making a couple hundred grand, right? What can that guy do to prep for the correction? Yeah, so, you know, listen, I, I think it's very important that young people understand that there's more opportunity in downturns than there are in good times. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're able to uh, put cash aside and, uh, and, and make, you know, meaningful relationships with people that have access to capital, uh, and deploy that cap capital when when markets correct. Um, you know that would be my advice to everybody. Uh, it really depends on what your role is in in the industry, essentially. But from an investment standpoint, I think everybody should start getting ready to uh, look at real estate and uh, and study it so you understand when it's a good price to actually purchase. Yeah, you know, so this was uh, this was supposed to be a big year for me from a buying units standpoint, um, and I just held off. Right. It's just being, deal, deals were slim. I bought a couple uh, that, you know, I just found a great deal on, but I like, I wanted to buy 15 units this year. I yeah. bought, I bought four and, but it was the right decision because things are coming. I'm going to get them for, you know, 50, 60 cents on the dollar, maybe less. Like who knows? And sit on, sit on your money. And uh, I would say that to get, get ready to deploy it in the next 12 to 18 months. That's exciting stuff though, for guys who are ready. You'll come out the other side looking good. Looking really good, man. It's, you know, it's these, it's these cycles that people, you know, the ones who take advantage of it, you know, and have the access to the money that you need in order to buy things in a downturn, they're the ones who really, uh, you know, get, get to the next, next level. Well, that's, uh, the, that's, that's the beauty about real estate too, man. Like, even if you're like, you're a young guy listening to this, you're like, Okay, downturn's coming. I don't have capital. Pay attention to what Jay said. He said, network with individuals who have access to capital, right? There's going to be an, a huge opening for young guys who understand real estate to be able to raise capital and syndicate deals and come right. out of the downturn with a tremendous amount of equity and net worth. That's right. And, and you don't need the money yourself. You need the deals. Right. So any any smart real estate investor that has money is happy to do a deal with you if you have the product. So that's really what it's about. So young people can go out and really understand, focus on a certain, you know, certain area. So, you know, you know what a good deal looks like in that area. Be hyper focused on that. So you're an expert. You could be an expert in, you know, in one neighborhood and do really, really well. Right. You don't need to be an expert in the entire country. Um, and honestly, I'll be honest, I, I focus so wide nowadays that I'm not focusing enough locally on how, how to invest my own money. Uh, and that's a problem for me. And, and, you know, when you're building big businesses, you know, there's only so many hours in a day. But uh, kudos to you because you're, you're doing it, man. You're investing and that's the smartest thing you could possibly do. Well, you know, be like, I, I'm lucky, you know, like th my market is. It's a tertiary market, right? Multi, you can, single family early on is a viable investment option here in certain parts yeah. of town, right? Yeah. Multifamily, relatively cheap. You don't have to have 50 million to own 25 units like you do in New York. You know what I mean? So you get the opportunity to do a lot of deals and learn on a smaller scale, right? Like it, it's just... Honestly, for that, there's not much I like about the place that I live. Um, you know, my wife and I are going to move out of here within the next 12 months. Um, but we were going to move it in January, but we had the baby, underestimated how much help we needed from the family. Um, so, you know, we just kind of tabled that decision for now. But that is one thing that's beautiful about here is just cost of real estate and your ability to learn it. You know, and I got lucky enough to get introduced, well, no Andrew growing up, who we spoke on the phone with, yeah. and uh, he's two years older than me, was already in the commercial real estate game, was representing a private real estate investment trust, and I had the opportunity to learn the whole investment deal, learn development, like working on that. Now, it's, uh, it's a, it can be a fun world. Yeah, he and I have had several calls, by the way, and I think, you know, I, I gave him some good advice. Uh, you know, he, he's looking to, to, to follow my um model a little bit and work more with national retailers and i think i gave him some good insight that's awesome that's a, he's a he's a sharp dude man he is yeah he, i could tell yep um so tell me this you know 
one thing that I like to get into, uh, one thing that has always fascinated me about successful individuals is habits. Um, you are like me. You can just work and work and work. How do you do it? It's my oxygen. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it, it's like a gift and a curse because I, right now it's six o'clock, it's Friday. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's 12 o'clock on Monday. Yep. And, you know, that's, so I'm passionate about what I do. And as I mentioned to you earlier, I feel like I haven't really achieved any success. Uh, and I'm not saying that to sound cool. I just, you know, the reality is that, again, I'm, I'm just scratching the surface as to what I expect to achieve in my life. Um, so, you know, it's, it's about being passionate. And uh, it's about really loving what you do. You know, if you're going to go, you have to love what you do if you spend the amount of time and energy doing, you know, do, doing what you, what, you, what you need to do to become really successful, right? right? This stuff doesn't happen overnight. And it's not easy. And anybody who tells you it is, is lying. Anybody who tells you this is lying, that is true shit right there, man. Like, I, I was just talking about this with an individual yesterday. And dude, in my short time, I mean, I've put a ton of money in the bank. I've lost it all. Like, I am gone back up again. Like, there. thank God my wife is the most amazing person on the planet because I am a total mess. I, <laughs> 90% of the time, I'll be like, babe, the fucking world's coming down. I'll, I've cried. I've just, dude, it, it, like this deal is not sexy. And Instagram thinks that it is. Yeah, you're absolutely right, man. But you know what? Authentic, authenticity, I think, is what people relate to at the end of the day. And, you know, that's, I, I've gotten to a place in my life where I'm the same person, you know, in the office, at home with strangers, with relatives, close friends, I, I'm just myself. And, you know, and that's an amazing place to get to, you know, I, I've achieved enough success in my life to be able to dictate what I want to do each day, right. um, you know, and work with the clients that I want to work with. And, you know, that to me is success, uh, having that level of freedom uh, to be able to, to, to be more, you know, pick and choose who I want to work with uh, and so on and so forth. But, you know, I think, I think it'll be interesting also, though, Brody, to see what happens to social media through the next downturn. Right? I, I agree. You know, like, I want to know what's going to happen to, like, even, like, I mean, guys, just influencer. I mean, because we've got people right now doing, you know, multi multiple six figures, a small portion doing seven figures. And, I mean, fucking brand deals, like, YouTube. Dude, I don't know what's going to happen. Because these individuals, they don't, they, you know, and I don't want to say they don't work, like, you know, they do what they do, but like, yeah. they're not fucking business people. You know what I mean? They take pictures, they get paid sweet. Right. It's yeah. awesome right now. But what happens when companies say, okay, we know that paid ads works super well. Right. And then we know that like someone in a downturn is going to be less likely to buy based on an influencer's recommendation because they don't have any, like, who knows what's going to happen, dude. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting. And I think, you know, the, the one thing also that I, I hope it does, you know, in the downturn uh, in, in the commercial real estate industry, uh, a lot of, the, a lot of the, the, the people that are not as good at what we do are weeded out. And I always, that's kind of a, a positive thing. And I'm never rooting for the failure of anybody. But the reality is, you know, there are plenty of people in this industry that give people like myself a bad name. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or, or just uh, don't shed the night, the best light on what we do. So that's a positive thing. And I think that, you know, hopefully some of the people that are just faking shit for Instagram will go away, or at least yeah. that's what you're thinking because I'm so sick of seeing it. Yeah. You know, that that's a good point. I mean, there, there is a total positive to it. Like, I mean, it just, it opens back up like the low hanging fruit for guys who are real like us, you know, I mean, we're strategic, we're taking what we can, but there's still so much out there that's just being, picked off right yeah so yeah. you know a lot of people spending a lot of money on on you know just advertising and you know putting themselves out there and and that's going to tighten up too so yeah to see what happens but yeah tons of interesting stuff coming so okay so tell me tell me about this you know we're, we're approaching you know where we need to wrap it up the one thing that i want to, to walk us through your routine man what yeah, do you sure. what do you do in the morning to set yourself up for success 
Yeah, so I'm I'm all about uh, working out super hard every morning. So you know, I wake up. I have two young kids, mm -hmm. so I wish I would uh, do more meditation and journaling. Uh, I'm, I'm that's definitely uh, a focus of mine for 2019. Uh, but yeah, I just do it. Up. I know, I know. You, 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 what do you mean you would I, just do it? No, I agree. You're absolutely right. And, and, and I'm going to. And, um, you know, so I wake up and, and I, I, I focus on gratitude because, you know, I don't necessarily write things down, but I, I take time to myself and focus on things that I'm grateful for because I find that if you do that in the morning and you appreciate all of the things that you have and everything that, you, that, you know, other people would, would love to have, right? Like health simple stuff right yeah um you know no matter what you encounter in that day nothing can take you off task because it's not that bad right you know you have your health and and my, i have my family and all of these other things that are the most important things so i focus on gratitude for one uh and then if you want to get real literal about my routine i represent starbucks as you know so i drink a, way too much caffeine during the day uh, so I, I make my first Keurig cup of Pike's Place coffee. I chug that. I get in my car in my workout gear. I go straight to typically a boutique fitness class, whether it's a HIIT workout class, a solid core class, uh, anything that's somewhat difficult and uh, intense. And I go straight actually to the Starbucks drive-thru on my way to the workout. I get an Americano, a grande Americano and a venti cup. I chug that on the way to the workout and then I crush the workout. Uh, shower, get ready for my day, and I feel like I, I can take on the world from that point. So uh, every day is different. You know, uh, you have to be, to do what I do, you have to be able to pivot uh, and juggle a lot of things at once. So there's no, there's no book for that. I love it. I love it. Okay. So before we wrap it up, give me one last piece of advice to the so, under 35 entrepreneur, give him a nugget out of Jay Ciano's head. Go work for the person in the industry that you want to achieve the most success in for practically free and figure out how to make ends meet as young as you possibly can. Learn, if you learn from the best people in a spe specific industry that you're focused on, you're going to be very good at that because you're going to learn not just the, the, uh, terminology and, and tools of the trade, but you're going to be able to watch uh, their behavior and understand what makes them successful. So go learn as much as you possibly can from people who are doing what you want to do for 15 years plus. Awesome. Awesome. So for everyone listening, thanks for sticking around. I know this has been a long one. Jay and I vibe well. We tend to do this every time that we get off the phone until one has to run because we have another obligation. So I'm going to link all of Jay's socials in the description. I'm going to drop his email. Make sure you sign up for the vlog. Where can they find that? Yeah, the vlog, just shoot me an email, Ciano, S-I-A-N-O at Sabre, S-A-B-R-E dot life. Got it. Got it. Yeah, and I'll make sure that all that's in the description. Jay, thanks for coming on, buddy. Yeah, it's my pleasure, man. Follow me also on Instagram, Jason, J-A-Y-S-O-N dot C-A-N-O, S-I-A-N-O on Instagram. You'll find everything else from there. Perfect.